Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today we'll be discussing the miracle that is the Six Day War and we'll be discussing the 50th liberation and unification of that great city, Jerusalem. Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today we'll be discussing the miracle that is the Six Day War and we'll be discussing the 50th liberation and unification of that great city, Jerusalem. Warm welcome to the program and I have uh, two very special guests in the Jewish community to discuss the Six Day War and the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Jerusalem. I'm joined by Peter Baum who's the uh, co-founder of South End Friends of Israel. Welcome to the program Peter. Hello. And also uh, Zalmi Unstorfer, who is the chairman of Likud UK. Hi. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Um, I'll, I'll start off with you, Peter. I know that, the, that uh, you were on only a few weeks ago and uh, very much liked by our viewers from the last program we did together. But um, can you share with us your first memories of uh, that incredible six days that occurred in June 1967 that is now known as the Six Day War? Yeah, indeed. Well, 67 happened to be my bar mitzvah year. Uh, I was for Mitzvah literally uh, in, in, in May of 67, so for me personally and for my family it was quite a remarkable year anyway. But the one thing that I do remember above all looking back is in those days when, uh, when I was at school we didn't have laptops or iPhones or all the technology that are available to our children these days, but we did have transistor radios. And I can distinctly remember at lunchtime, although uh, we weren't allowed to bring our transistors into the uh, into South End High Grammar School, uh, all of the Jewish guys used to uh, assemble uh, before morning prayers, have the uh, uh, transistors at the ready, and every break we got, we were keenly following where we could the events of that six-day war. And uh, the first things that I remember, the news reports were coming out, were about the Arab armies massing their troops, tanks and uh, military equipment on the borders uh, of Israel. I think the Egyptians had been inundated with Soviet equipment and we were at the time I can remember being absolutely petrified about what was going to happen and yet even though we were scared and worried and concerned there was something in all of our minds that we were saying to ourselves, this won't happen, we, we, we will get over this, we will get through it and be successful. And it was a true miracle, six days following that first day, that um, Israel not only survived but was so victorious uh, in those horrible, in that horrible week, that horrible period that unfortunately cost so many lives. And uh, Zalmi, it's been too long since you've been on the uh, Middle East Report, so welcome back to the programme. Great to be here. And uh, Zalmi, what impact did uh, the Six Day War have on, on your family in particular? Um, I, my memory of the eve of the Six Day War <coughs> is about um, black arrows. And the black arrows were on a black and white TV um, news programme, because we had black and white TV in those days. Um, and the BBC or ITV was showing how the armies were going to be coming from the north, from the east, from the south, um, all overwhelming um, Israel. <clears throat> and like um, and like my colleague here, it was it was a really frightening time to think that there was such overwhelming odds. I now know that around about the same time, um, the burial societies in Israel were measuring up parts of Yarkon Park in Tel Aviv for mass casualties. So it, it wasn't just us that were in trepidation and the people of Israel in trepidation, but the actual powers that be at the time were 
quite overwhelmed by the odds, not really um, prepared for the miracle that, that was going to take place. And, and it was a probably the greatest miracle um, of our times, I would say. Absolutely. Uh, and Peter, I mean, many people now, particularly those uh, revisionist historians claim, and also those that are anti-Israel, claim that this was an aggressive expansionist war by Israel. But they don't realize that uh, it was uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, the president of Egypt, that triggered this war um, by calling on the UN peacekeeping troops in the Sinai to withdraw, uh, blocking the Straits of Tehran, signing a joint military agreement with um, Jordan as well as Syria uh, and also the Syrian government was also responsible for bombing kibbutz, kibbutzim in northern Israel, um, ships on the Sea of Galilee and everything else so Israel had no other choice but to go to war did you? So I'm, you're absolutely right but actually you've stolen my thunder there because I was going to repeat everything or, or state everything that you've just said no it's true. Um, NASA being the uh, what he thought the leader of the Arab world did all those things. He um, withdrew the UN troops and he uh, closed the shipping channels for, for Israeli shipping and was massing troops on the border. Uh, he also cleverly uh, managed to persuade the then uh, King of Jordan to enter the war and to this day um, history tells us that he, uh, King Hussein did that reluctantly. Um, nevertheless um, all those Arab armies were opposed to Israel and it, wasn't, it was certainly not a war of aggression. It was a war of defending Israel's right to exist, simply that. So uh, there are historians that are trying to rewrite history and what happened, but no, it was definitely uh, a defensive war and um, thank God that the Israel performed so well dur during that time. I had the... Um, uh, joy to listen very recently to um, uh, the gentleman uh, Yitzhak Yafit who was uh, at the front of that iconic photograph of the paratroopers at the um, Kotel and he recounted some amazing stories about his experiences during that war which maybe we'll, we'll come on to afterwards but when you listen to someone uh, such as him, a true hero of mankind and such a quiet, um, self-deprecating, uh, intelligent person. Um, it's a joy to be here and to recount some of the stories that uh, he, he had to uh, tell us. Yeah. Uh, and Sammy, if, if we, we place ourselves back in that situation, place ourselves in uh, Israel in uh, May uh, 1967, just before the build-up of war, um, what would it mean like for, for Israel, uh, a, a, a new nation as it were? We know that Israel's uh, an ancient nation, but we know that Israel was reborn as a nation on the 14th of May 1948 in fulfillment of biblical prophecy. And here we are, this uh, young reborn nation, many of them, um, like in, in your family, survivors of the Shoah, um, again fighting for their survival. What was the reaction in Israel and the reaction of world jury to the events that were happening uh, around Israel? Well, there's an expression in Hebrew, um, which has been used by Ben-Gurion and all the way downwards, called Ein Breira. We have no choice. The fact is that we never had, have had any choice. Uh, Jews throughout um, history have been moved from one place to another behind pogroms and, and, and all kinds of um, evil um, ethnic cleansing all the way down to the Holocaust. Um, we don't have anyone to stand up for us except ourselves and the Lord. And at the end of the day, we have even today, even though Israel is the strongest nation in the Middle East, strongest army in the Middle East, uh, and all of the advancements and so forth, we still have to remember that any peace agreement which depends on pieces of paper, whether it is from Mr. Abbas, whether it is from the Arab League, whether even it is from the United States, um, is, no, is no good to us. We have to have the tools with which we are able to defend ourselves. And defend ourselves, we will, as we've proved. Absolutely. So let's uh, remind ourselves of the uh, miracle that occurred during uh, those incredible six days back in June 1967.
incident to upset the chancelleries of the, the Muslim world. nations in the Middle East would not accept Israel's existence since its founding in 1948. They began amassing huge amounts of sophisticated weaponry and lobbying for the implementation of boycotts, divestment, and sanctions against the Jewish state. On the 15th of May, 1967, on Israel's Independence Day, a three-week period began, which was one of the most tense and fearful periods in Israel's history. In direct contravention of international agreements, Egyptian leader Jamal Abdel Nasser removed the UN peacekeeping forces and began moving tens of thousands of soldiers and hundreds of tanks into what was the demilitarized Sinai Peninsula towards Israel's southern border. Egypt also blockaded the Straits of Tehran, an open international waterway which was essentially a declaration of war. Israel turned to the nations of the world, primarily to the United States, for assistance against Egyptian aggression. But somehow, all Western countries decided to remain neutral. Very quickly, it became apparent that the promises were all but forgotten. Israel, with 2.5 million Jews, was left alone to face the might of the Arab nations. Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Lebanon formed a military alliance and began moving forces into Jordan towards Israel's borders. When the Arab countries realized that the world had abandoned Israel, many other Muslim countries were openly calling for the destruction of Israel. The will and means to murder millions of Jews were evident. Top IDF commanders expressed their concerns at the high price Israel was liable to pay in a war with the Arab world. Some military experts projected a toll between 20 and 100,000 lives. Israel prepared cemeteries all over the country, ready to accommodate many expected victims. Massive parks were prepared in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, and other cities in case the cemeteries would have no more space. World governments, instead of defending Israel's right to exist, warned Israel continuously not to attack. However, the people of Israel had no choice but to go to war, to defend their country in their very existence. At 7.15 a.m. on June 5th, 1967, the IDF launched Operation Moked Focus. Almost the entire Israeli Air Force was dispatched in a daring mission. Only 12 planes stayed behind. The risk of this operation was extraordinary as the fighter pilots flew at an unprecedented low altitude of less than 20 meters above the ground. Egypt had the most advanced ground air missile defense systems in the Middle East. Most of the Israeli jets were old and outdated French planes. If the Israeli jets would have been detected, many would have fallen and Israel would have been left with practically no air force. And then a miracle occurred. The most advanced Russian MiG jets that patrolled the airspace along the borders between Egypt and Israel were, for that one critical hour, grounded. Incredibly, at that very same time, the top commanders of Egypt, Jordan, and Iraq flew together to observe the Egyptian forces invading Sinai. The Egyptian officers had ordered all anti-aircraft units not to fire unless given a direct order as long as they were in flight. This created total confusion on the Egyptian ground as Israel struck exactly in that window of time. By 7.45 a.m., the high hand of providence resulted in the Israeli Air Force reaching all the Egyptian airfields without even one plane being detected. More than 200 Egyptian planes, almost half of Egypt's fleets, were almost instantaneously destroyed, also bombing the runways and making impotent the mightiest air force in the Middle East. General Moti Hod, commander of the Air Force, said, in my wildest dreams, I never would have conceived of such an incredible success. A second wave of Israeli jets were directed to Cairo to confront the remains of the Egyptian Air Force. And here, another miracle occurred, no less miraculous than the first. Even though Israel had lost the element of surprise and the anti-aircraft systems were operating with full capacity, Egypt was only able to hit one Israeli plane. The Israeli Air Force went on to destroy a total of more than 300 Egyptian planes, and every airfield in Egypt was neutralized. It was nothing less than a military miracle. 
seemingly impossible. Absolutely extraordinary, isn't it? Uh, Zalmi, um, I'm inspired by uh, watching that uh, report on, on the Six Day War. Now, how much was this down to good intelligence and how much was this down to the hand of God being upon your great nation, Israel? Watching that, that clip, I had one verse in my mind. Hashem yilachem lachem v'atem tacharishon. God will fight for you and you be quiet. And there's no other explanation for it because... You know, at West Point, they analyze battles going back to Roman times. Um, and the one that they don't, they're unable to analyze is the Six Day War. It just doesn't make sense on any level. Um, and I've said to you, Simon, very <laughs> often, I've quoted you that amazing phrase that was said to me, I think, I think by one of your Christian colleagues, um, that coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. Wow, that's quite a car. Um, and in this case, I think um, he was a little bit less anonymous than he normally <laughs> was. Uh, and we hope that he will continue to be a, um, a defensive force over our people. And of course, we have to keep trying ourselves. You know, we're, it's called hishtadlut. Hishtadlut means making your own efforts. At the end of the day, God helps those who help themselves. Uh, Israel helps itself very well, but there's no explanation, no logical explanation uh, for this other than uh, divine providence. Uh, and Peter, I mean, um, I mean, Israel had no other choice than to actually strike first as, as part of the IDF doctrine of transferring the battle from Israel's territory onto their enemy's territory. Uh, and the only way that Israel could, uh, Israel's military generals thought they could win this war was to actually strike first in what was self-defense. But also, I, mean, I remember being in Israel and uh, reading a report in the um, Jerusalem Post when I was in Israel in, in 1996, and it talked about how the Israeli intelligence had actually revealed that the Egyptians had bombers with chemical and biological weapons on it ready to strike Tel Aviv. So it's no wonder that Israel then decided to wipe out the entire e Egyptian air force and then the Syrian air force and I think the Iraqi air force in a matter of a couple of days in order to win air superiority. How important was it that Israel won that air war? Well, it's probably the most important issue in the war itself and um, if my knowledge serves me correctly I remember that the uh, Israeli Air Force were flying beneath the radar so they went completely undetected in what was a remarkable effort of flying skills a absolutely unprecedented in, in flying history in, in, in war and those Israeli pilots did an absolutely remarkable job in uh, destroying the air forces, as you say, of uh, Egypt and, uh, and Syria as well. Absolutely incredible. Um, and Hashem. Absolutely. Uh, and and tell me, I think the other the fact we have to look, when we're looking back at this period of history, was the fact that uh, this was also the Cold War. Yes. And the fact that uh, the Assyrians and the Egyptians were being sponsored and supported by the Soviet Union. Uh, and at the time, as that uh, news report showed, that Israel only had the Mirage French jets. They weren't backed up by American support. Um, and yet they had to take on pretty much the might of the, uh, of the Soviet Union in actually dealing with the, the height of Russia's technology in terms of its uh, missiles and its air defense system, including uh, Russian MiGs as well. So that was also a, a, a proof of how powerful um, Israel had actually became in that war. Uh, and do you think that the Six Day War represented a turning point in Jewish history? Oh, without, without doubt. The Six Day War was the, was the watershed. It was the beginning of the return of the Jewish people from all corners of the world. Um, because the sight of Jews returning to the Wailing Wall, the last remnant of our temple, was so awe-inspiring. It stirred the hearts of every Jew who ever sat at a Seder table and heard next year in Jerusalem, because they could see it on their screens that we, we are in Jerusalem. So kids would come out, birthright Israel started, um, the great um, Torah academies um, of Eastern Europe, um, which had been ravaged by, by the war, started um, reforming um, in Israel. Um, uh, so all of these um, elements of, of um, Jewish life, whether it was the ultra-Orthodox, uh, whether it was the Talmudists, whether it was the Kabbalists, whether it was the 
um, the, the secular Jews who were looking for some meaning. Um, wh whoever it was, they came from Russia, they came from Ethiopia, they came from France, they came from Britain, they came from the United States, and just flowed to Israel, mostly the youth. Um, and that is what we've seen flowering today. It's the youth of 67 that has created the powerhouse that we see Israel um, is today in terms of technology and, and everything else that goes with it. I mean, you've heard that narrative so many times, but this was the, I wouldn't call it the Big Bang, but it was pretty close to the Big Bang, and out of which has expanded this incredible um, Jewish um, rebirth of Jewish life in, uh, in, in their homeland. Uh, and, and Peter, I mean, um, you're saying that you had uh, friends that uh, wanted to go up and serve. So I, I guess when, when Israel became the major center of news during that summer, particularly as the war started, no one knew what the outcome of the Six-Day War would be, uh, let alone it would actually be finished in six days and Israel would more than triple the size of her territory and defeat three major Arab armies at the same time. There must be a, a feeling within your community at the time that many wanted to go and volunteer to help Israel either to serve in the army or to work on the kibbutzes to, to really help Israel in our hour of need. You're so right. Uh, another uh, memory of that time, don't forget, as I say, it was my bar mitzvah year, um, 67, but um, many of the my community in their late teens and early 20s, uh, men and women, went out to volunteer for the, uh, to do what they could for Israel, whether within the military or helping on the kibbutzim or just with general administration life. There was a price to pay, Simon. Um, I know that um, several families still resident in the South End um, lost sons, not as a direct result of dying in battle, but through um, problems associated with coming back from Israel after the war. Um, mental depression uh, that stayed with them and ultimately resulted in their deaths. I won't mention the families' names because I wouldn't want to embarrass them. Uh, many stayed out there having seen what it was like uh, and stayed and made Aliyah within the war. Some return and still go back there to see uh, uh, friends and families fr from those war days. But yes, indeed, I, I don't think our community, although a secular one, was any different from any other of the secular communities within the U United Kingdom. There are stories of employers holding jobs open whilst uh, the g men and women went out to Israel and came back. Uh, I've read a report very recently that the, uh, the very famous hairdresser in the West End, Leonard uh, allowed some of his Jewish staff to go to I Israel, fight, in, uh, go and, and help out, and when uh, they came back, had their uh, jobs um, open for them. So there were many stories like that. And the other thing that was remarkable, I can't remember any families actually um, putting too many barriers in the way of their children in going out. It was. It had that depth of feeling, that passion, that religious feel, that need to go for Israel's survival that allowed so many young people to actually go to a war zone with such support from their communities and families. Amazing, amazing. So let's uh, watch the uh, second part of the uh, miracles that occurred during the Six Day War. Then another miracle occurred. <laughs> It was as if God hardened the heart of the Egyptian president Nasser, who continuously gloated about his glorious military victory over Israel. In the Arab media, President Nasser spoke of the end of Israel's air force and of the Egyptian tanks on their way to Jerusalem. Jordan, Syria, and Iraq believed these bombastic statements and wanted to join him in the great victory against the Jews. All the Arab air power struck simultaneously on multiple fronts. In almost any other scenario, Israel would not have been able to respond as quickly as it did. The timing was seemingly orchestrated to position Israeli jets exactly where they should be. Not in six days, but in six hours, the war was won. A biblical prophecy comes to pass as the forces of Israel sweep on in an astonishing triumph of strategy. After achieving air supremacy, her forces thrust like an avenging sword at the very heart of Arab self-confidence. And then, perhaps, the greatest miracle of all, a miracle Israel never expected, Jerusalem.
Again, it seemed as though it was a divine appointment in time. Jerusalem was to be restored to the Jewish people after 2,000 years. The enemies of Israel had twice as many soldiers as we did, three times as many planes, four times as many tanks. The odds were stacked against us on every military front. The love of Israel, self-sacrifice, and courage of the Israeli soldiers, combined with divine guidance and assistance, made these miracles possible. Yitzhak Rabin, then the Minister of Defense, was given the honor of giving the war its name. He chose the Six-Day War, we're calling the Six Days of Creation, as Israel too was created with the liberation of Jerusalem. As the center of gravity of the Jewish people has now returned to the land of our fathers, the Torah center of the world has once again returned to Jerusalem. The chief rabbinate of the state of Israel has established the 28th of ER, a day of Hallel in Hodaya, praise and thanks for the salvation of our people and the liberation and return of our capital, Jerusalem. Jews in Israel and in every country in which they reside come together in prayer and celebration. Similar to Hanukkah and Purim, it sometimes takes many years for the miracles to be fully recognized and celebrated. The Mizrahi World Movement is involved in massive community-wide celebrations across the globe, from London to Los Angeles, from Melbourne to Johannesburg to Chicago and Toronto. For 2,000 years, our hope never died. Our faith as a people never wavered. Wherever Jews were and whenever they prayed, they prayed facing Jerusalem. Whatever happened the night before, whether it was the Crusades, the Inquisition, Muslim oppression, or Nazis in Germany, the next morning a Jew would wake up, dust himself off, put on his talit, face Jerusalem, and pray to come home, knowing somehow, some way, God would bring us back. This is our greatest celebration to be alive in this generation where the prayers of our fathers and mothers have finally been answered, to be alive and to take part in Jewish destiny. To experience miracles of divine providence by Amim Hahem, Basman Hazeh, like in those days, but in our time. Well, that was uh, very inspirational and, and uh, very moving. Uh, Zami, I'm just looking at that uh, report there and, and looking at the likes of uh, Israel's Prime Minister at the time, uh, Levi Eshkol, uh, seeing uh, Moshe Dayan there and also Itzhak Rabin, who was uh, Israel's Chief of Staff, and also not forgetting the incredible work um, done on the diplomatic front by Abri Ban. These people were the kind of founding fathers of the modern state of Israel. They, they were giants and legends in their own, own right. H how did the Six Day War um, really make people like Moshe Dan a legend in Israeli history and Israeli culture? Well, if we believe that the divine um, providence was at work, uh, and it's, it would be very hard to deny that, uh, that it was, um, then um, God puts his placemen where he needs them at that time. Curiously, Levi Eshkol made the most, stut most stuttering, unimpressive uh, speeches on TV in the run-up to the Six-Day War. Uh, the country had no confidence in him, and it was only when they w became a coalition um, of, um, of, um, of a government of national unity that um, Menachem Begin asked for Moshe Dayan to be put in as a defense minister. Uh, and. Um, uh, the results were equally miraculous. You know, we talk about um, airplanes and we talk about um, these amazing um, feats of um, military uh, prowess. Um, but the miracle of Jerusalem started in the basement of the Knesset because inexplicably sh um, Jordan continued shelling the, the uh, uh, West Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, there was an emergency meeting in the Knesset and some shells hit the Knesset. 
and the uh, Knesset meeting had to go down into the basement into a into a room where there was mops and buckets and in this room of mop, mops and buckets it was when Begin approached um, Eshkol and said they're shelling Jerusalem we should we have the right to respond and in responding maybe we should take Jerusalem too and Eshkol said well that's an interesting idea and it <laughs> was from that idea in a basement mop room which now has a plaque on it saying this is the room in which this discussion took place that resulted in us making that extra push to get Jerusalem because mi mi miraculous the Six Day War may have been but the jewel the enduring prize that we have do we have the Sinai anymore we don't have the Sinai anymore okay we don't have shelling from the Golan Heights but the enduring gift of the Six Day War is Jerusalem and whilst these guys liberated it, we have to fight for Jerusalem every single day, even today, against the UNESCOs of the world and the United Nations enemies of the world who seek to deny our right to that eternal capital city. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Peter, I mean, when we talk um, about the liberation of Jerusalem that occurred in uh, in uh, June 1967, the fact that uh, how must it have been for Israelis living in Jerusalem to knowing there was a big divide between uh, West Jerusalem and East Jerusalem and that the Jewish people were not permitted to go to the most holiest site in Judaism, which is the Hakot al Hamaravi, the Western Wall, um, to pray? Well, nothing can sum it up better than that very small glimpse of a photo we saw that iconic photo uh, taken by David Rubinger of the four paratroopers looking up at the Kotel. That picture tells 10 million stories and really tells the story of Judaism from the time of Abraham right to where we are today. It's the most remarkable picture. And uh, I think I said earlier on that I had the honor to listen to uh, one of the paratroopers in that picture, Yitzhak Yafit, who very recently uh, gave a talk at the Board of Deputies of British Jews. And um, he's a remarkable man, and he took the time uh, to relate two very uh, sen sensitive stories. If, if, I, if I may, I'll, I'll be as brief as I can. Uh, imagine this, in the height of battle, with the Israeli paratroopers fighting uh, the Jordanian army, um, they heard a woman crying, and they kicked down a door, and a woman was giving birth uh, to, to her baby, and the Israeli paratroopers called over medical staff to deliver the baby, and uh, in, this is in the height of battle. And then after the battle was won, the soldiers went to where the battle was fought to lay stones and say Kaddish for their friends and uh, the guys who had lost their lives there. And after that, they went a little bit up the hill and they actually laid a monument uh, in the name of the Jordanian soldiers who they th thought had fought so bravely against them and also lost their lives and left their loved ones. And unfortunately, that monument that they laid is no longer there. They, they don't know why, they don't know who destroyed it or who, who kicked it down. But I think those two small stories say so much about Jewish people, Judaism, and the way we live our lives and want to live our lives uh, going forward. Uh, and tell me, what it must have been like for those uh, Israeli paratroopers that... Um, were fighting their way through hand-to-hand -hand combat in uh, Jerusalem in order to preserve the holy sites and then to enter into uh, Zion Gate and you see the, the bullet holes on the top of Zion Gate even now and what they must have felt when they actually went through then into the it was Christian quarter then into the Jewish quarter uh, and then saw the Kotel for the first time. Well it was it was awe-inspiring. One of the uh, people who was there when that photograph was taken actually told his story in Jerusalem uh, about a month ago uh, during Passover. And um, he, he told this astonishing story that um, the, uh, the, the uh, head of, the, um, of that division was Motagor, General Motagor, who took, he's the one who took the, the Wailing Wall. Um, but his um, chief, uh, chief of staff was a very tall, brave, and tough guy um, and he was in tears 
and they said, well, this must be a very emotional moment for you. And he said, yes, it is for all of us, but for me it is even more emotional because I, as a child, um, um, was on the border of Germany when Germany invaded my country. Um, and they invaded my village, and they killed every single person in that village that first day, with the exception of me and my mother. And I was only, I don't know, it was six years old or something like that. And um, he said, if my parents would know, if the people in the village would know that m me standing here in, in parachuting boots <laughs> was liberating the heart of the Jewish nation, the thing that we have all striven for in the, in the diaspora for centuries, um, they just wouldn't believe it. And that's, that's what got him at that time. So you're talking about bravery, you're talking about huge emotions, uh, and you're talking about, as I said, a complete outpouring of, of the meaning of the word Jews in their homeland um, and, and bringing life to the expression next year in Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, Peter, I mean, not only did the uh, Six Day War and the miracle of the Six Day War ha and the liberation of Jerusalem have a profound impact upon uh, the Jewish community worldwide and the nation of Israel, it also had a, a big impact on many um, Christian Zionists who really saw that uh, this was God's hand of providence working in Israel and that God had um, allowed the, uh, the, the reunification of Jerusalem in fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Is this when so many um, Christian ministries then started to rise up in support of Israel? So what impact has um, Jerusalem today for the Jewish people, knowing that it was thanks to the bravery of these amazing Israeli soldiers uh, that uh, Jerusalem is now under your sovereignty? Yeah, I, th I think you're, you're right um, in that when the Six Day War was over, Jerusalem was reunited, that gave a tremendous boost to believers. There is no doubt about that. There's no need for me to elaborate on the whys and wherefores about that, about talking about biblical prophecies, etc., etc. The other side of that, Simon, unfortunately, is as much as we've won the biblical belief battle, if I may put it that way, we've certainly lost the PR battle. And there are as many um, people within um, churches and within other religious communities and even those non-religious communities who still believe that Israel are the aggressor, that they're there in Jerusalem illegally, that Israel is an apartheid state. We've heard the adjectives, etc., 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 and it's only through challenging those, those views via religious organisations and our beliefs that I truly believe we will eventually win that battle as well. We may have won the military battle, we've yet to win the hearts and minds of a huge um, proportion of the populace out there, irrespective of, of their beliefs. Mm. Uh, uh, and, and, and Zalmi, I mean, having read your father's book, uh, you know, The Yellow Star, which was very powerful uh, and very moving and, and you know, almost takes you through the horrors of, of what he went through uh, during World War Two at the, uh, the hands of the Nazis. Um, how, must he, how, how much would you think if he could look back and see Jerusalem now under Israeli sovereignty, well, knowing actually, the Jewish people have come home? Um, actually, my father died in that year from an illness he contracted in the concentration camp. Um, and he, he re had refused surgery. Your father died in 67? Yes. 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 Remarkable. Uh, in, in November. Um, and uh, ironically, he, he died because he refused to go under the knife of, a, of an Egyptian doctor, heart surgeon, huh. uh, who then turned out to be Magdi Yacoub <laughs> many years later. Um, so he, he didn't live to see that. Um, but I remember taking my son to Yeshiva, which is the Talmudic Academy in Jerusalem, which overlooks the, West, the Wailing Wall, overlooks the Temple Mount. And I'd just taken him there with all of his kit and stuff and moved him into the, into the yeshiva for his year of learning. And when I came out, and it was in the evening, I came out and saw the Kotel Plaza in front of me. And I thought to myself, this is me living what my parents and grandparents paved the way for. I am actually living, um, I am living their dream. And my son in the yeshiva overlooking the old city with an Israeli flag fluttering over it, as it will be forevermore, is living 
um, the dream of all of those who perished, not just in the Holocaust, but in the pogroms and all of the other conquests and um, ethnic cleansing that went on of our people over the centuries. So that's, that, that for me is a very, very internalized message. And I feel, I feel great that, that, that I have the, uh, the zuchut, the privilege of, of actually living that message, uh, delivering along with all of the other Jews um, uh, who are defending the state of Israel. Incredible. Let's have a look at some uh, original archive uh, news reports at the time. Uh, the first one is a British news report, uh, followed by an uh, American report on the liberation of Jerusalem in June 1967. Jerusalem. Israeli Prime Minister Levi Eshkol must be the proudest man in the world, especially when he entered into the Jordanian sector of Jerusalem and to stand before the Wailing Wall. To world jury, a deeply emotional occasion of great historic importance. Hero today of the Jewish peoples, General Moshe Dayan, defense minister and architect of the swiftest, most overwhelming victory of all time. In the Sinai Desert, in the wake of Egypt's catastrophic retreat, lie Nasser's wrecked tanks, more tanks than were destroyed in the early Alamein campaign. Inspired by General Dayan, four Israeli commanders achieved the great triumph. Gavish, the commander-in-chief, Yaffa, Sharon, and Tal. When Sharm el-Sheikh, at the mouth of the Gulf of Aqaba, fell to the Israeli forces, it shattered Nasser's attempt to blockade the Gulf. The desert tank graveyard will bear evidence of the sheer futility of NASA's military aspirations till the sands of time obliterate the wreckage. The whole world hopes that from great victory and utter defeat, wisdom will emerge and bring lasting peace to this part of the world. in the Middle East. Israeli forces drive spearheads across the Sinai Peninsula, west to the Suez Canal, south to the entrance of the Gulf of Aqaba, breaking the blockade, capturing the west bank of the Jordan River, and occupying the old city of Jerusalem. The first crippling blow came early in the four-day war, when the Arab Air Force was destroyed on the ground in air raids on 25 bases in three countries, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. Israel's new defense minister, General Moshe Dayan, hero of the 1956 Sinai campaign, was instrumental in mapping his nation's battle plan. The sudden swiftness of the Israeli army crushed UAR forces with a combined air and ground one-two punch. Egypt's charges that U.S. and British air units aided Israel are vigorously denied, while diplomatic relations are broken. Efforts toward a ceasefire continue at the United Nations. U.S. Ambassador Arthur Goldberg introduces the peace plan. An immediate debate is started in the Security Council representing 15 nations. While the United States and Russia disagree on the wording of the resolution over troop withdrawal, Israel's Foreign Minister Abba Ibn charges UAR President Nasser plotted the murder of a state. The vote is finally taken and the resolution adopted unanimously. Word continues to come from the battle zone, telling of sweeping Israeli victories. Next day, Egypt accepts the UN ceasefire, joining Jordan. This left Syria facing Israeli forces alone. The United Nations arena remains in the world spotlight because of the many questions raised by the short but decisive Middle East war. With Israel now controlling the Sinai Peninsula, all approaches to the Suez Canal, Old Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and the Gulf of Aqaba, the diplomatic struggle now begins. Quite extraordinary, wasn't it? Uh, looking at those uh, two uh, news reports, particularly the first one, which was British, which seemed to be very pro-Israel. Um, Peter, are you actually surprised about how uh, pro-Israel the first uh, news report was uh, dating back, uh, covering those events uh, back in June 1967? Not entirely, because one of the other memories I have of that period was that the media in the late 60s was genuinely pro-Israel. 
Uh, this 22, three years after the end of the Second World War and the Holocaust period, the world really hadn't uh, resigned itself yet to getting over those atrocities that were still very fresh in their minds. So for that period, with Israel's success, no, I actually wasn't that surprised about the um, pro-Israel uh, content of the media output. It all seemed to go wrong and being anti-Israel in the early 70s. And I guess it was no coincidence that that was when the um, oil boom uh, and the economics started to come into play rather than the difference between right and wrong. So um, up, seeing that film uh, it was quite heartening, uh, just very depressing uh, to follow the uh, footage and the media content from the uh, early 70s to the present day. Uh, Zami, we're down to the last uh, six minutes of, of, of the program, and I think um, you've already on this program expressed uh, your love and your passion, your devotion to uh, to Jerusalem as a city. Uh, but we know that today Jerusalem is under threat, um, and there is a lot of speculation that uh, President Trump will move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to uh, Jerusalem. If he does that, what impact will that have on Israel and the Jewish community? Well, I think, it's, I think it would be a good thing. It would be easy to do because there already is an Israeli consulate um, in Jerusalem um, and it just needs to have its name changed um, to, to embassy. Um, I think it would be a good thing because I think we need, to, we need to get away from this fiction that Jerusalem is some kind of a settlement. Netanyahu has said many times in public, Jerusalem is not a settlement. Um, and um, we need to also understand uh, that Jerusalem, for as long as it's been under Israeli control, has been free to all religions. Absolutely. No one has given freedom of religion in, in Jerusalem uh, in history um, to more religions uh, than Israel has. Uh, and therefore, we must have sovereignty um, over Jerusalem. And uh, it is an ongoing and continuing stain on the uh, relationship uh, between our America, America and Israel uh, and their relationship that the embassy that theirs should not be the first of the major embassies to be moved to Jerusalem. So I think that is an important statement uh, to make. And I think peace will be, will be uh, achieved through strength, not through prevarication and worrying about the politics of moving an embassy one way or another. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and, and Peter, I mean, Jerusalem represents the eternal capital of the Jewish people, but it's also at the epicenter of our Judeo-Christian heritage. And we know that the, the Muslim Brotherhood want to conquer Jerusalem in order to make that the capital of their Islamic caliphate. And there is a battle being waged in the United Nations, in UNESCO, um, in the, in the uh, world of public opinion, and, and also in international relations when it comes down to the status of, uh, of Jerusalem. Uh, what role can Christians play in strengthening and supporting um, Israel's rightful claim uh, over her eternal city, Jerusalem? Okay, before I answer that directly, Simon, I, I must endorse what my colleague Zaimi has, has just said. There is no doubt that the move um, of the Trump administration to move the uh, embassy from Tel Aviv, stop calling it a consulate, call it an embassy and move it to Jerusalem, I, th I don't think there's any better time to do it. And it wouldn't surprise me if Trump did it, some other nations may, may follow suit. I, Israel currently is making some huge inroads, especially uh, on the African continent. They're almost where they were in the 60s when uh, Israeli agricultural uh, and technical experts were doing such great work in Africa. And it's uh, the Netanyahu government over the last 18 months or so that is beginning to reclaim some of that, some of that lost territory. If they did that, and if our Christian friends, uh, colleagues and brothers could start um, uh, endorsing that, whether through their local churches, their local Friends of Israel, Israel groups, uh, to the wider community, if that message to st could start getting across that actually Israel is, uh, that Jerusalem, I'm sorry, is the eternal religious administrative, whatever adjective you want to put in front of it, capital of the Jewish people, um, the more people that can get that message across, whether it's through meetings, social media, uh, 
people like yourself pushing that message across, then that's what, that's what needs to be done. We will get there. It's an uphill battle, but we will get there. And I think if the Trump administration have the brave, the, it will be courage. They, they've mentioned that they, they would do it running up to the election with the new um, Israeli am, uh, American ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, being such a staunch uh, supporter of Israel and the Jewish people. It's possible that we will be in that position within the next uh, three to nine months. And uh, Zami, do you, do you plan to be in Jerusalem? I know it's your second home or first home because I know you've got a, a house out there. Um, but how will you be celebrating uh, Yom Yerushalayim Day? Well, I'll be celebrating Yom Yerushalayim here in London with a special celebration in, the, in our local community. Um, but I will be going out shortly for the festival of, of Shavuot, which is the end of the, uh, uh, the um, 50 days from Passover. Um, so that's the next um, festival that I'll be going and I'll be going to the Wailing Wall as I always do on the first day of every one of the three festivals uh, with great joy and um, to again be living the dream um, you know and enjoying every moment of our reconnection with um, the heart the beating heart of our people absolutely and uh, you know Peter how, how will you be celebrating uh, Yom Rushlein Day uh, Rather like tell me I should be at home. My two sons should be out there, and uh, I hope they come back with wives. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. And um, in order to kind of go forward, um, how, how can we, how how can Christians play a greater role? Do you think in, in supporting um, Israel and the Jewish people and uh, strengthen their righteous claim on Jerusalem? I think you know. <laughs> It's strange that you know we've gone through this 2,000-year period of, of oppression, and now we're seeing this happening to the Christian populations um, in all parts of the world. And I think the, that Christians should be announcing that that they are safe in in the in the land of the Jews. Um, it's 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 quite astonishing that since 1948, Israel's founding, uh, the Christian population of Israel has gone up five times whereas the Christian population of the Middle East has gone down by four-fifths. Uh, gentlemen, I just want to thank you for a very special program today as we discuss the uh, miracle of the Six-Day War. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you indeed. And I just want to thank you for watching today's program. And let's thank the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob for his hand of deliverance during the Six-Day War that was nothing short of a miracle. And the unification uh, and the liberation of Jerusalem is something that we should all celebrate as that's part of our Judeo-Christian heritage. So I want to thank you for watching today's Middle East Report. Thank you.